Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. We are the STEM visualizations team, and we created an online pedagogical tool for data science utilizing Bokeh. So just for a quick introduction to our team, we're all students at Lehigh University in our junior year. I am Neil, and today I'm joined by my teammates, Timothy and Shu. We also have two key advisors who have helped us along the way, and those are Dr. Raghuram Thiagarajan and Professor Srinivas Rangarajan of the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. And we've also had external help in the form of Steve Anthony of the Lehigh University of Technology Services, and all late Professor Vincent Grassi, also of the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. So there are four key things that cause us to start our mission of building interactive visualizations to teach topics in science and engineering. The first one is the COVID-19 pandemic. Students during this time really lack the interactive experience that is so sorely needed in STEM education. The second issue is the STEM retention rate. Anecdotally and from actual evidence, students have trouble understanding complex STEM topics due to mundane and traditional teaching styles. The third issue is the STEM dropout rate. Dropout rates are high in my opinion due to the inability to properly engage students. And the final issue is the lack of resources outside the classroom. Without proper supplementary resources, students' interest in these topics wane outside the classroom. So here's a quick introduction to our current repository of visualizations. On the far left here, we have our reaction kinetics model. Right next to it, we have our SEIR infectious disease model. And on the far right, we have our zero energy cooling chamber model. In the middle here, we have our data science model, which is what we're gonna be focusing this talk on today. So before we get into the details of the data science model, we wanna talk a little bit about inquiry-based learning. A key of all our models is to promote this type of learning. And for those of you not aware, what inquiry-based learning is, is an active form of learning where questions and scenarios are posed first. Some of the benefits of this type of learning include, it promotes a deeper understanding of content, it provides a new, fun, and engaging way to learn, and it builds initiative and self-direction in students. So to really test out if our models exhibited inquiry-based learning, we conducted a formative assessment of a group of freshmen at Lehigh who were taking an introductory engineering course where the zero energy cooling chamber model was utilized. One of the key questions we asked was, are learning these concepts through the model we built a more effective way to learn than simply reading a textbook or listening to a traditional lecture? We re received a strong average of 8.75 out of 10 on that question. And the second key question we asked was, inquiry-based learning is a technique which promotes active learning through posing questions, scenarios, or problems. How well does our model promote this technique? We also received a strong average of 8.25 out of 10 on that. So before we begin to show our model, I'd like to talk about what what the data set entails. The data set that we're using is the catalysis data set in which we're trying to see how, how these catalysts improve the reaction time and reaction rate. And then within that data set, we have different input features, such as the, the, the oxygen flow, methane flow, the temperature and the and conversion rates. And then we have the products that, are, that come about from, from, these, from these reactions that, that are taking place like the the carbon that's produced and other and other things so this is a video of, of of the model so basically we have the model description so we have the model description first and then we have a data equation tab with the user and they'll play around with the data and see how the how the different features interact with one another then we have a correlation matrix which just to help the user see how the different values relate to each other and we add a color for more interactivity and then we have a multivariable regression model in which the user can select different features to build the model and to predict a particular Y value or a product that is being made. So we, we have the, the coefficients of the variables on the side. We have the R, the R squared scores and the RMSC scores on the left as well. And then the user can then pick what kind of model they want, if it's linear, quadratic, or cubic. And below we also have and we've divided that into training and testing to see how well they work together. And we have an error histogram at the bottom. We have an unsupervised learning model in which the user can pick different number of clusters that they want and then number of principal components that they want to, to test their data on. So this, this just continues calculating the, the importance of the different variables in this, in this. And then we have a classification model in which we want to in which we want to predict which, how much, how much carbon will be formed at the end of each one of them. All right, well, 
in order to create the interactive data science model, we utilize Bokeh to uh, generate the web, app, web, web application. The whole process is a loop that we uh, first select the data by filtering the empty data point, and then let the user to choose uh, choose which data set they want, they want to include in the module calculation. Second so learning is a library that provides most of the data science algorithm. So we can use the, so we can train, the, train and mo uh, build the model uh, by the, using the function it provides. Um, but create is a firmware that translates Python code into HTML. Since our initial goal is to create a web application, we use functions such as uh, plots and tabs to lay out all the components we need. After implementing the module, this process will keep going whenever the, the user changes the data attributes. And this is the workflow of the regression model. Uh, we, were, we were utilizing the attributes from data sets to create this model. First, data cleaning, we remove all the empty data points, and then we decided uh, the kinds of selection tools we need for the user. Since this is uh, a multivariate regression model, multiple x value can be selected. Um, so methane flow, temperature, and total flow are the most important attributes in this case because when the users select the, those attributes, they will see relatively better scores. Uh, the data set will then be divided into training and testing data sets. And we will use the training set to build a model and calculate the scores. After getting all the necessary data points, we will use Bokeh to, uh, to set up the plot table, error histogram, and the line indicators. By looking at the scores and the plots, the user can decide whether to accept or rerun the uh, selection process again. So after that, we have a classification model in which we, we, we classify if, if the catalyst that we're using is, is a good or bad catalyst according to the carbon selectivity that we get from the product. So first we create a classifier in which we, we check if the carbon selectivity is either above 40 or below 40. And then we sample the data set by like to 40% to of it, and we select the target variable. And then we create controls for the user to select what, whichever feature they want to put into the reaction. So, the, so we, we, they can choose either the temperature, the methane flow, the oxygen flow, or, or any other feature. And then with that information given, the, we, divide the, we divide it into training and testing sets. And then we create the model using Scikit-learn. And then we plot the graphs. And then we generate a confusion matrix, which will basically count how many, how many of these, how many of these were, were made, were, were selected correctly in the right, in the right bracket. And then we calculate the evaluation matrix, metrics, which include, which include the accuracy, the F measure, the recall, and others. Okay. Our goal is to create interactive web application for STEM students. We are currently in the process of getting all the feedbacks on the data science model we just created. And we want to use the feedback to make our application to be more user-friendly. As some models on the website, such as Zero Energy Cooling Chamber Math module, was already integrated in the Intro to Engineering courses, our next step is to make more visualization models in more innovative topics to help the students in STEM field to visualize the concept they were learning class. So thank you so much for listening to our talk. Um, we'd like to acknowledge the Office of Creative Inquiry at the University for providing us funding and guidance throughout this project, and also the National Science Foundation for inspiration. Thank you so much, and we're happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, Timothy, uh, Raghuram, and uh, Zhu for delivering the lightning talk. Uh, I think we are, we are almost at the time, so we'll, you can take your questions over at the Slack. Uh, do we have Logan here? Yes. Hey, everyone. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, I appreciate the, the icebreaker and how's it going, everyone? My name is Logan Kilpatrick. I'm the community manager for the Julia programming language. Um, I'm also on the, the board of directors here at NumFocus. Uh, so really excited about this talk. And I think this is something that I'm, I'm super passionate about. Uh, and the, the sort of general topic for, for today's talk is around non-code contributions, sort of non-technical contributions in open source, why they're important, how to enable them in your own specific scientific um, or, or open source package, 
uh, community and uh, let's let's dive in and talk about some of these things. So one of my one of my favorite quotes, and at some point this will turn into a T-shirt, is that uh, there's more to open source than code. And I think for a lot of us, uh, or at least speaking from my own experience, I think there's lots of uh, I'm sure technical folks here who have sort of done a lot of technical work in the open source space. So you know. You know, when you think about open source, the first thing you think about is, okay, I'm going to open pull requests, I'm going to commit code, I'm going to, you know, do all these deeply technical things. And I think for for first time contributors, for new members of communities, that's oftentimes, you know, some of those specific mechanisms to contribute to open source are a little bit more difficult to, to tackle, you know, right at the beginning of your open source journey. And again, throughout this talk, I'll sort of make the high level argument that um, setting up these sort of contribution pathways for folks who, who maybe aren't ready to dive in and, and make a pull request or a code contribution um, will be helpful for your, for your specific ecosystem and community. So when we talk about, okay, so, you know, someone is perhaps not ready to, to make a code contribution or perhaps doesn't want to make a code contribution. What are the, some of the, the sort of other ways in which somebody can make contributions to an open source project? And I think, you know, I've, I've tried to highlight a few of them here on the screen. Some of these things can be, you know, helping out with social media outreach. outreach. I think, you know, for a lot of open source projects, um, you know, they, it, it's, it's something that could potentially be neglected if, if they don't have somebody who's in that role, sort of doing this outreach, responding to people on social media, um, all that stuff. And at, at the end of the day, you know, that might be the way in which new contributors come into your project is they, they see something on social media and they decide, hey, maybe I want to go and contribute to, to NumPy or whatever it is. Um, so I think that's one possible option for folks who are interested in getting started. Um, blogging is a huge one. If you're like, hey, I'm not ready to make a code contribution, perhaps just, you know, try out some tutorials, uh, you know, write a use case, something really simple and share it with other people. And I think not only is that good for the project because they're getting exposure, they have a user who's advocating for them, um, but for the person who's actually doing that, it's an important step as well because I, I think, and it's just like giving a talk, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult to sort of formalize whatever your thought is until you've had to put it to spoken word or put it to written word. So I think both of those options are, are really, um, you know, beneficial for the person who's actually giving that uh, writing that blog post. Uh, another one that I think is perhaps flying under the radar a little bit, and I'll just talk about it for a moment because it's something that I've personally done, um, is posting questions on Stack Overflow. I think a lot of the times people, um, you know, and, and it's not specific to Stack Overflow, any Q&A platform, but sort of finding out what pain points are for people who are users of your specific software and going and asking those questions. If you know what the issues are, you know what the pain points are, going and asking those questions on a platform like Stack Overflow or Discourse um, and then answering those questions yourself, if you can find the answer, um, will actually make it so that, hey, the next person who comes along, they don't have to post in some channel or they don't have to take the time to post. They can just go and find the answer to whatever their problem is right away. And I think that's a super impactful way of, of contributing to open source that, again, isn't, um, isn't going to show up on your, on your GitHub profile activity uh, necessarily. So again, hopefully this sort of lays the, the groundwork for you know, what some of these possible contribution uh, pathways might be for somebody. And again, I've, I've talked about this notion of a, of a contribution pathway a few times, but what does that actually look like? And again, I sort of conceptualize this, this arc of contributing and, and the last stage in this arc of being a contributor in open source is the code contribution. And again, if you're an experienced developer, you're experienced in open source, perhaps you can sort of dive right into that depending on the project and your familiarity and all those things. But I think presenting this this idea to new contributors that, hey, the expectation isn't that you're gonna come in and sort of solve some deep con concurrency problem in a well-known Python package as your first contribution, like that's totally okay. That's that's not the expectation that we need to set for contributors um, and, and setting the expectation that, hey, you can take all these smaller steps and then eventually maybe you go through those smaller steps a few times and then finally make a code contribution. Um, I think this is a, a super important idea to, to reinforce to people. And again, I think uh, this, this sort of highlights the idea that the, the developers in open source aren't necessarily the only people 
um, that that are important to the ecosystem. You have people who are sort of running things perhaps a little bit more from behind the scenes. You have release managers who, who perhaps aren't um, necessarily contributing new features, but helping orchestrate you know, some of the higher level logistics of making sure that all the features that other people have written actually get released in a, in a reliable and meaningful way. Um, so there's, there's lots of different roles sort of in the open source community and space. And I think um, keeping that in mind as you, as you push forward in your own open source uh, journey is important. So again, thinking about how, from a community standpoint, from a maintainer standpoint, from a actual contributor standpoint, are these open source contributions going to come back and, and actually impact the community and also your own personal journey? Um, I think there's a, there's a few different pieces. Again, a lot of the sort of underlying uh, trend behind all these sort of non-technical, non-code contributions that I've mentioned so far is in the realm of communication, communicating ideas to folks, probably technical ideas, because it's because um, it's open source. But I think that's such an impactful uh, impactful thing to learn about and experience to have. And again, if you're sort of just in the beginning of the the sort of open source journey, um, or perhaps trying to attract people to your project who are just in the beginning of that open source journey, um, you know, talking about the benefits of of being an effective communicator. Um, especially in technical topics, I think is one of the most important things that you can do. Um, again, this idea of building bridges within the community, a lot of times in open source, you have sort of these, these fragmented technical communities that sort of interact with each other in some capacities. And um, I think the idea of, you know, using communication, using all these non-technical contribution pathways to sort of layer these bridges on top of all these different sub-technical communities is, is the way that I think about this um, actually materializing. And the last piece is sort of broadening your own scope. Perhaps again, maybe you have the technical skills, maybe you can go and make the technical contribution, but you want to perhaps try something else out uh, so you can develop that, that other skill set, that broader skill set. So maybe you've been convinced that this is worthwhile to get started on. Um, so thinking about from a from a maintainer standpoint and also from a from a contributor standpoint, how can you actually get started? Um, so I'll, I'll talk really quickly from a contributor standpoint. Reach out to people if you're already part of a specific community. Some uh, you know, perhaps one of the one of the num focus projects you're already within that community. Um, reach out to people who you see doing the work already, to, whether it's maintainers or what have you, and say, hey, here's some specific idea of a way that I'd like to contribute. How can I go ahead and get involved in that capacity? Um, the other way to do it is what I would consider the permissionless approach, which is just go and do stuff. If there's an article that you think would be helpful, go and write the article. Um, if there's some other contribution you think would be impactful, make that contribution, then go and tell other people about it. And I think in general, people tend to be very, um, very happy that you've made that contribution. Um, again, for, for folks who are maintainers, I would suggest taking a look at julialang.org slash contribute. We're doing a lot of work there, um, sort of laying out the high level structure of this message that we want to tell people when they come to the Julia community, which is, hey, you can contribute to the Julia community without having to make some deep technical contribution. Um, so that's something that I'll, I'll refer folks to to check out. And um, again, the idea here is hopefully that you can help sort of fill those gaps, build those bridges in your own community. And um, I'm super glad I got to share this all. If any of this is interesting questions, shoot me an email. Always happy to chat about it. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, do we have Nick with us? Yeah, I'm right here. Yeah. Uh, awesome. All right. So I'm Nick Agarwal. I'm a director of data science at Make You Safe, and I'm also an adjunct instructor at University of Wisconsin Madison. And so today I'll be talking a little bit about <clears throat> how I use both R and Python in my workflow today, and I'm all from within R. So not having to go into like a Python IDE in any way, but just using R Studio and R, and then also leveraging Python libraries within it. So some of the stems from <clears throat> Um, my uh, my work where some my team members, uh, some of them are Python coders, some of them are R coders, and really there's been healthy discussions about R versus Python. And while it's enjoyable to see this conflict happen sometimes, some of those points that are raised are somewhat meaningful, but mostly the conversations I feel are not really useful in any way. Because to me, it doesn't really matter which language you use, whether it's R, Python, Julia, C, as long as the tool that you're using is effective. And languages to me are essentially tools. And if they can help you answer the business questions that you're trying to solve for, then it, then it works. And 
sometimes as data scientists or even data analysts or data professionals on my team, the issue becomes like, oh, if we're going to deploy this, then do I need to do this in one specific language? So a lot of my team members are in R, and so they feel like, well, if we're going to deploy this in Python, or if we have somebody develop something in Python, do we have to use all use Python for this project? And the, answer, the short answer to that is really, no, you don't have to, because not all of our models will go into production. But at the same time, if they will go into production, we really need to think about how do we want to deploy them? And it doesn't really matter whether it's going to be in R or Python, and we want to move away from that. And often we find that some libraries in certain languages are actually easier to use or more fun to use, uh, whichever way. So me personally, like I really enjoy using ggplot2 in R, and I don't enjoy matplotlib as much. Does that mean that matplotlib is bad? No, not really. It just means that I'm not as effective with matplotlib than as I am with ggplot2. And so if I'm doing data analysis and data modeling in a script, if I want to use ggplot2 and I also want to use Python um, like, S, like uh, scikit-learn or sklearn, how do I do that? And it's always been challenging. Before what I'm going to talk about, this package that I'm using, before that, it would be I'd have to do some work in R Studio and or in R and then save my work and export data out and then move into VS Code or some other IDE for Python and then go from there. So Reticulate is a solution to that. Now, I'm not the developer of Reticulate, so please uh, don't blame me for anything or, or ask me questions about how Reticulate works and in, in the inner workings of it. But Reticulate is a package in R developed by R Studio, and it really allows you to use a lot of Python libraries from within R and using R syntax. So you really get the best of both worlds. So if there's libraries in Python that you want to use or you feel like you want to develop models in Python, you can go ahead and use R for a lot of your work and including importing those libraries from Python into R and then being able to do that. And what's really cool about Reticulate is that it's able to translate a lot of the R objects and Python objects to each language really much on the fly. So if you have a data frame in R, it gets converted into a pandas data frame in Python, and then you can move forward from there. And that makes the workflow really fun because then you can use whichever tools you want from whichever language and really supplement your work to be even more effective than before. So as I mentioned, you can use any library you want. And what's interesting is that one thing I want to point out is if you use the Keras library in R, it's actually using Reticulate as well in the background. And it's using and it's leveraging Python as well already. So it's really cool to that if you're using Keras in R, you're already using it. And so you may not realize it all the way. And the best part is that if my team can then maintain that workflow in R so they can do all their work, so whether it's data analysis or data preparation and, and whatnot. And so that brings me to my typical workflow. So when I'm doing my data analysis and ingesting information and whatnot, it's coming in from R and I can use R to read in the data, to go ahead and plot it, do my exploratory data analysis, and even do some cool statistical tests and whatnot all in R. But then when it comes to data modeling, I can then use both the tidy model verse if I want to, or I can use sklearn, or I can use PyTorch or, or whatever libraries I want in whatever language, but I can use them all from within R. And I don't have to worry about knowing or having to move data from one IDE to another. I can just say one IDE or one script and just continue my workflow. In our organization, Deployment for our models is typically done in Docker containers. We, like for R, we'll go ahead and use Plumber and have R packages, internal R packages developed, and then we'll deploy from there. And in Python, we'll just use Flask and then deploy with, again, within Docker container and then be able to scale from there. So this screenshot is just a quick example, a quick uh, snapshot, if you will, of what, um, of how the syntax looks like for Reticulate. And Reticulate does try to keep some of the nomenclature as uh, similar to what's in Python as well. So for example, when you have to import libraries, you can just go ahead and say import and then the library name and then also the sub functions within that library. And then how to use them, you can, and within R, you can use the piping mechanism, you can use the, the dollar operator to find those uh, other uh, components within that uh, object and continue on creating dictionaries on the fly and also lists as what and whatnot. So it's a really powerful tool. And for most of our purposes, we've been, we've been able to use Reticulate very successfully in being able to use both Python libraries and R libraries. And we haven't really run into any issues. In terms of performance, what we found is that Reticulate works really well. In fact, we find that Python does a better job of parallelizing certain operations. And so we tend to use those uh, Python libraries for that, um, for that as well. And Reticulate can respect that. So. Um, and if you are a strictly Python user, like some of, my, some of my team members, and they really want to use some of the R functions or R libraries, 
There's RPy2. I don't have a lot of experience with this, but this is also a really cool library that what my team, uh, team work, uh, teammates have shown me and how they use it. And it really is really interesting how it works. It's very similar to Reticulate, but it works the other way around. You start with Python and you can use your R libraries and R functions from within Python. And so I just have a few resources to share with you. Um, I have an example of a full, kind of like a, a detail, more detailed example of how I use Reticulate or, and just kind of a walkthrough. Uh, link to RPy2 and then also a uh, link to this presentation and also a uh, way to contact me if you have any questions. Uh, I know this is a really brief presentation, a really quick one, but the goal here being that I just want to give you a small flavor of what Articulate can do and how it works for us and how we use it and why we love using Articulate within, within R and how we use the best of both worlds. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nick. I see a question in the chat. Uh, Reticulate versus RPy, which is better? Um. That's a good question. Um, I find that Reticulate has a lot of better documentation. So if you're trying to solve for a piece of sorting into certain issues and whatnot, I find that it's easier to troubleshoot the Reticulate side a little bit better and then, then RPy uh, too. But that's not to say that uh, I haven't done, like I said, I haven't done a lot of work with RPy too and so my teammates have and so they run into it. But generally uh, from my experience, Reticulate has really good documentation and I can solve a lot of my issues that I run into with just looking at the GitHub or the other uh, documentation that's out there. Awesome. Uh, do we have Ron with us? Yes. So I'm just going to talk this way in case I need to change something on the fly. Um, so this is, uh, I would say, what kind of different from many other talks I have seen um, in this PY, um, PY data global. So uh, like first, a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Ron. I'm a business intelligence engineer at Unit 21. Uh, we are anti-fraud, uh, like uh, anti-money laundering financial um, company based in um, San Francisco, but I personally work from uh, Los Angeles. So, um, but before that, I was a data scientist at uh, uh, Galvanize, which is a, a training for, um, institution for, to help people transfer to the data science domain. So uh, I, this is my personal hobby project. I would like to share some of my, my discovery. Topic is, can the best language model detect the logical fallacies? Um, the subtitle is can AI help us become better information absorbers? Um, I'll do some definition first. Um, well, by the way, I will focus on the what and the why question rather than how, because we probably don't have enough time. So let's talk about the fallacy side. So we, I, we can classify the fallacies um, into two big groups. The first part is the so-called formal fallacies. The second part is the informal fallacies. So formal fallacies, they are fallacies that violate the logical structures or the forms uh, of a statement. For example, um, if A is right, then B is right. Okay, this is a fact, we accept that. Then we say A is wrong, then we can say, okay, therefore B is wrong. This is not right. It's not right, not because the facts it states is not right or not, because we have no knowledge about that. What we know is that the form is wrong. So here's another example. I say like uh, all apples are spicy. Well, that's obviously not true, but uh, let's accept it. Then I say, I have an apple, therefore my apple is spicy. Then like in terms of the form of the statement, it's true. But in terms of fact, the, the, the soundness, it's false, but we don't care. So this is called formal fallacy. You can essentially write uh, some, how to say, hard code some rules for computer to detect whether it's a fallacy or not, if you have a set up through uh, like a prayer. Uh, informal fallacies, they are a little bit tricky. That's why I come to the uh, deep learning for the rescue. The informal fallacies, they are more, uh, they're wrong about the content or the context. For example, here is a typical fallacy. It's called straw man fallacy. We often see them um, in political debates or advertisements. So I'm sorry, it's downtown Los Angeles. Uh, so say above says, I think pollution from human contributes to climate change. Okay, this is a statement. We don't know whether it's true or not. But I just can say, okay, you think humans are directly responsible for extreme weathers, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff I just can say. So this is like, Alice is attacking something that Bob does not claim. And Alice says, oh, if that's the case, maybe we just need to go to the south to perform a rain dance. So that's even like a more uh, extreme statements. The idea is like you just, uh, um, Bob just uh, um, doesn't answer, Alice doesn't answer Bob's statement directly. 
However, we human we easily fall into those fallacies and wouldn't be able to actually uh, detect those issues the first time we saw that, or we are just uh, being driven by the a political, like a, you know, the rhythm of the debates, something like that. So, can we resolve this? Well, probably can, but we cannot do it manually. If you Google like a informal fallacy, you will see some websites that collect those fallacies. But it's not possible to build database that to, uh, you know, capture everything because people create those kinds of uh, stuff every day. Then we turn to the language models, and they're super powerful. Everybody knows that. I believe everybody in the channel knows that uh, in this um, meeting. So start with BERT. Uh, it's the start of the new era. It has about 100 uh, mating parameters, probably. Then GPT-2, GPT-3, and uh, latest today we have uh, the unreleased uh, uh, model from Google. And I just uh, searched uh, like five minutes ago. It looks like there is a uh, next generation is like a 100 trillion parameter language model. Well, it's like uh, the competition between um, like uh, those model builders and the Federal Reserve, like just putting up numbers. So open AI, like uh, the open source, like not open source, Somehow they provide the uh, GPT-3 available for the public to use. So we just take advantage of that to see whether I can use its classification like a um, functionality to help me to detect whether a statement contains a, like an informal fallacy or not. All right. So I have uh, these three tasks to do. The first task is to collect the data set with ground truth label. Unfortunately, there is no such database available. So just uh, uh, doing my own labor work, uh, collect those sentences. So the, the, there are two choices to collect this um, database data set. One choice is like uh, you have a pair of sentences. Uh, one is uh, uh, talking about a, to a topic um, deliberately con that contains informal fallacies. Then you just talk it uh, like how to say more rigorously or scientifically, like you explicitly uh, exclude the, the info, uh, existence of informal fallacies. Another way is just that you collect the informal fallacies and just some ra other random sentences. The second case is more close to our like uh, uh, daily life, uh, the real life, but uh, it will make, I'm, I'm still trying to gauge which partition of those two parts should I use in the data set. The second part is to perform some explorer tests on several kinds of informal logical fallacies. There are about 40, 50 most common uh, informal uh, logical fallacies. And how does the performance vary? So uh, a, a, a acknowledgement goes uh, here, you need to go to Arpurin, like uh, for his post on Medium, because when I first started working on this, uh, his article is the only one on the internet that I can find that talks about this concept. And I also talked to him uh, on LinkedIn to uh, discuss this uh, like uh, direction, which I think is pretty fine, pretty interesting. So the task two, so I frame the following types as a classification questions. So um, if, uh, you basically, I didn't use an API, just to use uh, the playground on uh, OpenAI's website. So you can uh, provide some training data, not, act, not essentially training, but like uh, you can ask uh, OpenAI to predict the, the labeling of the corresponding statements. As you can see, this is what we, we get typically, you can have yes to indicate whether it's, uh, it is a uh, informal fallacy and no, exactly, you can check the probabilities. So uh, the one lesson I learned is that you always show the probabilities because sometimes even the result is yes, but it's just slightly better than no, then it doesn't make too much sense. So we have several different, one, different, different ones. So um, here's some early finding I would like to show you. So for some times, the results seem to be really nice. For example, strongman fallacies can almost always get caught. And there's a, like, no surprise because there's their intuition there. The intuition is that there are essentially two different topics that are discussed. There is one, like uh, the country should invest more in education. Another person says, oh, what? You want to reduce the military budget, put our country at risk. So military budget, education, they're basically two somehow neighboring concepts here being discussed. Um, the, the open AI history model can capture this like a uh, uh, contrast and they show the uh, rhythm. Am I out of time? No, okay. Then, but for others, 
Not really. For example, false dilemma is a typical example. The false dilemma, well, if you see this, you know what this false dilemma is. So either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. That's what uh, before like uh, the um, Afghanistan war break out, like uh, um, President Bush uh, make a statement. So obviously this may not be true. Like uh, you can be neutral. Uh, somehow uh, it's it's just a, you know like a war cry, but it's false dilemma. Unfortunately, um, the um, model would not be able to capture the difference between this one and this one. I think uh, the intuition here is like the context is, uh, is lost. If you just provide the sentences, um, the, you know, the, the post sounds like a strong words in war, troops, terrorists, um, but uh, the AI does not understand exactly what these sentences mean. Okay, so here is a potential direction I would like to do. The first one I just mentioned that like you can standardize the data set and uh, you can uh, create two kinds of data sets to see which one works better. And you can, we can somehow we may want to train our own model and uh, just use the pre-trained model and uh, you know, buy some, uh, use some uh, very expensive GPUs to um, further fine tune that. You can also uh, like uh, use the fine tune like a uh, functionality on, op on open AI's platform. That's also a possibility. So one goal like in the short term for me is to want to create a browser extension for that. So whenever we browse um, the news, the analysis of what even watch YouTubes, then uh, somehow you can highlight the sentences with a higher probability that it contains informal uh, logical fallacy, which probably will make us better like uh, information absorbers and uh, thinkers. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. Uh, do we have Braden with us? Yeah, yeah, right here. Uh, over to you, Braden. Great. Um, so, hi, everyone. My name is Braden Riggs. I'm part of the Dolby Developer Relations team. Um, and I'm here to explore what I think is an awesome topic, which is uh, unlocking more insight from your audio data. Let's quickly speak about what Dolby IO is and why I'm here. Dolby IO is a self-service platform that provides a number of APIs that allow developers to build communications, media, and streaming solutions for things like podcasting or telehealth. And these APIs come in like two flavors, like we have our communications API and then our media processing APIs, which are kind of more relevant to Pi data. Now, some of these media processing APIs cater towards my data science background, uh, which is why I'm here talking about like audio data. Specifically, our audio analysis APIs, which can generate insight and create data from raw audio. And we'll kind of get more onto that shortly. But first, like, what is audio data and why should you be interested in it? Well, sound as we perceive it is fundamentally a series of vibrations passed through a medium and interpreted by the ear. You can hear me now because the speakers on your device compress air in such a way that we can interpret it. Now, of course, I'm not speaking in front of you in person. So between the step of projecting and interpreting these air vibrations is a computer, where audio is stored as a series of ones and zeros. When converting these air vibrations to zeros and ones, the computer needs to sample the air pressure at a repeated rate known as the sample rate, which is often 44.1 kilohertz or 44,100 samples per second. Now, additionally, these samples are taken at a resolution known as bit depth, or rather the number of bits stored per sample, commonly 16 bits. Hence, to store just one second of audio at 44.1 kilohertz and 16 bit storage requires 44,100 times 16 times one second bits, or if converted around 86 kilobytes. Now, additionally, most audio is two channels, which doubles this figure, and some mediums are recorded uh, at, at much higher sample rates and bit depths. So who cares, right? Well, for comparison, a character is eight bits, uh, which means that the amount of storage required for me to store my entire script for this presentation uh, only requires about two kilobytes. So why is audio so much more storage intensive? It's because recording audio captures much, much more than just the instrument or the voice speaking into the microphone. And the mistake lots of beginners make when analyzing 
let's say podcasts, let's say you're doing a podcast research program, a project is assuming that getting like a transcription of the audio, like just the spoken words uh, is enough of the picture. Um, and that's not to say that transcriptions aren't useful. As we'll see later, transcriptions are a great addition to your data set. Um, it's just that lots of tools or guides you find on the internet just focus on converting uh, that audio to text and then like perform sentiment analysis on the text rather than investigate the audio signals themselves. But obviously like something is lost in this conversion uh, and so much data is wasted. And that's the really exciting part about audio data. It's such an incredibly rich data source with so much information captured that we're really only just beginning to uh, scratch the surface and utilize it in data science for all that it's worth. Great. So we know what this audio data is, um, but how do we use it? And more specifically, like how do we use it effectively? Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to briefly touch on three tools that can help you learn a little bit more about the audio that you're analyzing. Our first tool is Pi Audio Analysis, which is authored by Theodorus Giganopoulos. Uh, and the tool can be used for a variety of signal processing related tasks, uh, most notably like visualizing audio data, extracting audio features, and performing unsupervised segmentation. Uh, and you can see an example on screen here of like kind of what these like feature vectors look like that can automatically generate from audio data. Um, I really like Pi Audio Analysis as like a first pass tool to use on data sets. Um, like I'm just getting started uh, with a project and I want to use it to do a bit of EDA or to see if I can classify or form some clusters in the group. It's a really great tool for that stuff. Um, the second tool is actually like two tools wrapped into one. Uh, I like to use MS Azure's Cognitive Services speech to text tool to create a transcript of the spoken words in my audio data and natural language toolkit to then analyze those words and perform tasks such as like sentiment analysis. Um, and finally, as mentioned earlier in the deck, Dolby IO uh, provides a variety of audio related tools. However, I specifically wanna focus on our analyze audio and our analyze speech tools. These tools provide a variety of insights into the data based on the audio signals itself. Um, and specifically, I wanna focus on like speaker and like music segmentation examples. Um, the API takes the audio and separates it into segments, which you can kind of see an example of the output there pictured on screen. Um, and then once it's split into segments, they're like time stamped, so you know, oh, like this person is speaking at this point, and then another person is speaking at this point. Um, cool. So like now with all three of these tools, let's look at an example of how we can like leverage the power to create like some stunning insights into the world of podcasts. Um, now, why did I choose podcasts? Well, podcasts provide an interesting mix of, of music and like intros and outros and speech, sometimes split among multiple speakers at irregular intervals. Uh, not to mention that podcasts have exploded in popularity in the last couple of years. Now, I don't have time to go into the full analysis, but um, here are a few highlights. Pictured on screen is the relationship between podcast popularity and downloads and the percentage of audio defects in the uh, podcasts, such as silence. Now you can see a spike in popularity that happens at episode 12. And this kind of correlates all of a sudden with like a change in the audio quality of the podcast. Now we can infer from this that maybe with their newfound popularity, they were able to get sponsors and with sponsors, they were able to hire audio engineers to, uh, you know, tweak their audio and improve it. Um, and it's interesting that you can kind of see that, that correlation in the data. We can also compare sports podcasts to say like business podcasts uh, to see the signal related dif uh, differences. I think we can agree like sports and business are two very uh, contrasting genres. So it's interesting to see that this, this contrast is actually reflected in the intensity of like each episode with the red being like our sports podcast episodes and the blue being like our business episodes. And if we really want to dive in, we can look at speaker patterns across the series. Pictured above is a speaker, uh, picture above is each speaker that occurs across this entire uh, series of podcasts. In this case, it was uh, 15 unique speakers across like the whole series. Uh, 
and in what part of the opening 10 minutes that they spoke. This is kind of what we're looking at. The brighter the segment, uh, the more often they were speaking on average. So for example, speaker zero at the top typically spoke within the first 100 seconds with a few particularly bright segments indicating that there was a pattern to when he spoke. Um, this is likely because he's the host of the podcast. He's introducing the podcast each week. Um, and there's like a variety of guests who kind of jump in or interject after that. Uh, and these visuals are mainly just to get you like thinking about some of the cool applications of these three tools and, and their synergies and how they can compare together to uh, maybe do some kind of out of the box stuff that you mightn't have, uh, mightn't have thought of initially. Great. Now, of course, this is just a lightning talk, so it's pretty brief, and I can't even scratch the surface of everything I want to cover, but I'm excited to announce that we're giving a full-length version of this presentation as a tutorial. Um, this will be on Saturday, October 30th at 8 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, 5 p.m. Central European Time, or Midnight Japan Time. Uh, now, of course, time zones are a mess, so if you want a reminder, I'll be posting to my Twitter or LinkedIn before I present. Uh, so give me a follow. I'd love to see everybody here there. Uh, and of course, if you're interested in learning more about our APIs, you can visit our event documentation. Um, we'd love to get any feedback everybody has and as many people to try out this stuff as possible. So thank you for watching. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Brayden. And uh, there's one thing I would like to mention. So Dolby is one of the sponsors of Pyeta Global. And uh, I would uh, like to thank you, uh, Dolby, uh, Brayden, you, and all the staff of Dolby to supporting us because it hasn't been possible without you. Oh. And uh, yeah, and you no, could also say, say thank you. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Jacob, we have Jacob, yeah. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Jacob Zelko. Good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. So glad to be talking to you. I'm from Georgia Tech Research Institute, where I work as a researcher and also as a contractor at the Centers for Disease Control. Today, my talk is on a visual odyssey, animations and visualizations made with Julia. This is me by myself and my co-creator, Ola Kroger, and there are the list of our maintainers for the project. So to begin with, we use a tool called javascript.jl, which myself and Ola have created. And javascript.jl focuses on creating an easy to use interface written in Julia to create visualizations and animations. Javis is a tool for exploration that gives users great freedom and flexibility to a user for whatever animations or purposes they, they may have. It should go without saying that Javis is actually an animation engine. It can create objects, render objects, animate objects, and together, it has all the main functionality that comes together to create an animation engine. Here's an example of an animation uh, created with Javis, very simple. Uh, in Javis, we actually emphasize a object and an action relationship where shapes such as square, like squares, circles, uh, are represented as objects. And movements like translations or the movements that you see taking place in this animation are defined as actions. As you can see in the bottom left, these are some frames from this particular GIF where each individual frame is generated almost like a slide reel. And here's just some uh, very simple, well, very basic syntax for how this actually works. You can see that an object is being defined and an action called animate rotate around is being applied to uh, the two objects we created, which are red and blue balls. This is as complex as we're going to get to uh, in this tutorial, as I want to emphasize more uh, the animation and visualization side of this tool. So now it is time to jump over to some demos. So first of all, uh, this animation was created by uh, then, uh, Mayan. And very quickly, I will run this animation just in the background as I discuss it. But what this animation was depicting is actually how you can use JavaScript.jl for specific domain applications. In this case, we are using it specifically for modeling the rotation of Venus and Earth around each other in space. And once that is done, once this uh, animation is done being rendered, we actually will get to see this animation. And believe me, I have stared at this animation for way too long, so many times as you model the orbits going around each other. And this is just one example to show how the animations can actually be uh, used to highlight uh, domain-specific problems. In this case, uh, Earth and Venus revolving around each other. And the reason why it's glitching a little bit right now is because 
this file is being executed in the background of Visual Studio Code, code which is just one of the many uh, one of the many integrations that Javis has in the development ecosystem at large. Moving from there, another aspect of Javis that I wanted to show was actually this. So first of all, here we have a very simple animation uh, defined in Javis with Julia. And that animation looks like this. So this animation was created using Julia. It's very simple, just four simple shapes. And if we go back and examine the syntax for Javis, we can see that it uses basic Julia syntax. But then as this is PyData, and I did want to show how Julia can also interoperate with Python, allow me to show you the Python translation of using Javis. So as you can see, we're actually able to directly use uh, the package called PyJulia within Python itself to be able to call the Javis uh, package from Julia to create not only um, you know, that bridging between the two languages, we can actually create PEP8 standard uh, Python code written exclusively in Python, implementing the underlying library of Julia. And again, just to highlight, this animation is both created by Julia and Python. So just to highlight how that interoperability works, I just wanted to demo that. And also just how the syntax, when we examine them together, almost look exactly the same, granted that there is some differences between Python and Julia. And then for my last example that I wanted to highlight was also this. So within, uh, within the Julia ecosystem, uh, unlike, uh, well, within the Julia ecosystem, we do have notebooks such as Pluto, uh, such as Jupyter, but we also have notebooks called Pluto notebooks. These Pluto notebooks do not have a global state and instead are actually uh, reactive such that there is only one single global state and they interact with each other whenever a new cell is created or run to update the state at large. In this case, if we scroll down, we can actually see that initial animation that I showed at the beginning bound to widget through which then we can actually work, walk through different aspects of the animation. This makes developing with Javis very easy and very fun as well. So you can see your uh, creations on the fly. And also to highlight, using Pluto Notebooks, this animation here, or rather this notebook here, was created by our maintainer, Giovanni um, Piacetti. And he uses Javis to actually illustrate the uh, motion and physics patterns of a simple pendulum using both Javis embedded within Pluto Notebooks. And actually, in the future, right now, this is a prototype example to show how Javis can be embedded within Pluto Notebooks and deployed onto the web. We can actually use Pluto Notebooks directly on the web themselves, interact with them as you, as I saw, showed you earlier with the code, and mess, uh, continue to mess around and tweak them to actually understand what these notebooks might be trying to show you. Now, getting back to our presentation. Javis, like as I mentioned, has many different qualities. It has an act action and object relationship, which is a different paradigm from other packages such as i3 in Java or Manum in Python. It integrates into the Julia ecosystem, such as with graph networks or linear algebra applications. And furthermore, there's multiple different workflows that you can use with Javis. You can, you can use Jupyter Notebooks, Pluto, you can even live stream animations being created in real time to a local area network or to the web. Our next steps for Javis is to continue to build out Julia Animator's organization. Javis right now is currently monolithic, but we're hoping to break it out into different packages specific to domains, such as mathematics, graphs, or physics, which are shown by the animations on the right. And as I said before, or as actually Logan mentioned, we believe in Julia that bridge building is immensely important. And that's why I wanted to highlight also how you can actually interoperate Javis with Python using Julia. And this could be the same for also R or MATLAB. And now finally, just to highlight at the end, uh, how can you get involved with Javis? So let me go ahead and take you to a couple of places where you can look. The first place is the javis.jl 
which is an open source uh, messaging platform that you can look at. Here we have a community of over 85 developers uh, and users of Javis talking about their ideas, how they can use Javis, and where they can improve uh, the package so far in package ecosystem. Additionally, we also have the Javis doc documentation, which is located here. The tutorials that you'll find on Javis, on the Javis animators website, were made with extreme care. As we know, animations can be difficult to make. And we want to make that as easy and painless as possible for you as a beginner to Javis.jl. Just to highlight, here's one of my fav personal favorite tutorials showing how to use layers within Javis to go for something like this. It's something as complicated as an animation that looks like an Andy Warhol painting. So coming back to the end of our presentation, I just want to acknowledge uh, some obvious inspirations, such as uh, Grant Sanderson of 3Blue1Brown, Daniel Schiffman of The Coding Train in i3, uh, Kremolian, a legend in the Julia community for animation and visualizations, and our Google Summer of Code students, particularly Arsh Sharma and our maintainers, uh, both Arsh as well, and Giovanni Puccetti. And finally, a huge thank you to all the contributors for bringing Javis to what it is today. Without your support, we would not be where we are. So thank you all so much for your time. And we look forward to seeing your animations. Oh, thank you, Jacob. And it, it was an awesome presentation. So uh, I specifically remember we invited uh, Virel B. Shah for PyDA keynote back in 2019. And it's so fun to see that Julia is doing so well. And there's so many beautiful packages coming out of it. And I just, I also, there's also a fact that I would like to emphasize that PyDA is not about Python. PyDA is all about Best data, best best data science practices you can do using Julia, R, Python, and any other languages that you use for data science. It's not just specific to Python. So every every language is basically welcome here. So yeah. Uh, now next we do we have John with us? John Cox. Um, so my name is John. I'm an undergraduate student at Emory University, and I'm excited to be sharing my project that I've been working on for the last ten months. Um, using generative adversarial networks or GANs to produce elliptic curves based on rank. So I'll start out with just a little bit of background on elliptic curves. So an elliptic curve is the set of solutions of the equation y squared is equal to x cubed plus ax plus b. And uh, below are two graphs of two different curves, which is uh, pretty typical of what they might look like. So there's a lot of features to talk about elliptic curves, but um, since it's just a lightning talk, I'll just skip over most of it. But um, most interesting things that elliptic curves are used for are in cryptography and also some outstanding um, theoretical math problems that use their properties. So the property that I use for uh, my project is the rank of the curve. And um, to th keep things simple, you can think of the rank as a measure of the size of the solution set for a given curve. So some properties about the rank is that there's no simple uh, pattern for knowing what the rank of a curve is given its coefficients. Um, there's conjecture that theoretically there's no limit to the rank of an elliptic curve, although the highest discovered rank is currently 28. And nearly all curves are of rank 0 and 1. Um, just about 50% are rank zero, about 50% are one, and almost 0% are greater than one. So knowing this about rank, I thought it would be cool to do my project on creating a deep learning uh, network that produces elliptic curves of specified rank. The current model that I'm working with right now um, is trying to produce elliptic curves of rank one. So to do, to do this, we use the GAN model. And um, the GAN model is a clever way of using two neural networks uh, to produce fake data that imitates real data. The first neural network is the generator that is able to generate uh, fake data. And the second is the discriminator that's a binary classifier that decides whatever data is fed to it is real or fake. So what this looks like in my project uh, what the architecture looks like is random noise input is sent to my generator, which is able to create fake um, curve data. 
And then I also have uh, a data set of real curve data. Uh, and these are randomly sampled into the discriminator, which is then able to produce whether it's real or fake. And then through um, training these neural networks through backpropagation and updating all the weights and biases, the goal is to be able to produce a generator that's able to create fake data that's um, undecipherable from the real curve data. So hopefully all the data it can create is of rank one curves. So the way that I am implementing this project is through PyTorch um, in a Jupyter notebook. And I use this because it's very simple uh, to update all the different key parameters of these neural networks. And um, I'm just going to give a quick demo of what this looks like in a notebook. So I have these um, classes of the generator and discriminator, set the parameters. Um, and then I train the data. And here I just have a simple data I should train in a few seconds. Um, and you can see through each epoch that I run that the losses are updating. And then um, after it's done training, I'm able to see what curves were produced by the generator. And um, then you can go through and check the accuracy of these curves. That's actually what I'm working on right now with um, updating parameters of all these models. But um, yeah, hopefully I'm able to produce uh, curves that the, the ultimate goal is to produce curves of high rank since those are considered rare. Right now, I'm just focusing on producing any curve of any specified rank. And that's where I'm at right now with my project. Uh, thank you for listening. All right. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it was a lovely presentation. And if, and if you have any questions with John, you can ask him over the Slack. Uh, so oh, we'll you. move on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to our next presentation. Do we have Timo Metzger with us? Yes. Hello. All right. Um, I really like the I really like the background and the screen. <laughs> hex plots. I yeah. love hex plots. <laughs> All done with Bokeh, of course. So that's yeah. uh, what I'm going to talk about. Basically, what is new in Bokeh 2.4. Um, I'm Timo Metzger. I'm a technical writer at MakePath. That's a company from Texas specializing in geospatial data science. And I'm also a core team member for Bokeh. Um, and what I will be talking about in the next few minutes is basically just a very quick introduction for the key features of Bokeh. What is Bokeh to those who haven't used it ex extensively yet? And then some highlights of Bokeh 2.4, and then maybe a little uh, preview of what we're thinking um, for Bokeh 3.0, which will be the next big release that we're working towards. So first off, uh, what is Bokeh? Well, in a nutshell, Bokeh is an open source Python library that allows you to create interactive visualizations that run in web browsers. So a Python thing that allows you to do interactive stuff in a web browser. I think that's, that's pretty exciting. And of course, these things in the web browser are JavaScript powered. But the nice thing about Bokeh is that you don't need to write any JavaScript code yourself. You can define your entire interactive visualization directly in Python. Um, so let's look at a few um, quick examples here. Um, so of course, that is all uh, directly from the Bokeh documentation. Uh, interactive meaning you can do uh, all the things in your browser. You can zoom, you can select things directly in the browser. You can do all the standard uh, visualizations and plots that you could think of, even some more uh, uh, unusual designs like this one here uh, works pretty much the same. And of course, it also all works in notebooks. So you have all the same interactive functionality directly in notebooks. Let me move that. And then another cool thing is that you can not only do plots or individual plots, you can actually combine plots and interactive elements to create entire dashboards. Again, all of that defined in Python and then run in a web browser as an interactive uh, dashboard. There's also several libraries on top of Bokeh, like panel and holo views, that make uh, these things even easier to use. So let's briefly go back and look how Bokeh actually does that. Um, there, so Bokeh is actually two libraries. Uh, there's the Python library, 
um, where you define your visualization and, and uh, do all your data things. And then there's a JavaScript library called Bokeh.js that runs in the browser. So whenever you do something um, on the Python side, whenever you define models, plots, uh, visualizations on the Python side, this information gets serialized into JSON. And this JSON data then gets used by Bokeh.js in the browser to render the actual thing you can see. Um, Bokeh also has a server component that basically keeps the data between Bokeh.js and the browser and the Python code synchronized. So uh, whenever your user does something in the browser, you can basically through callbacks handle that in Python as well. So what's new in 2.4? Well, very exciting is LaTeX. Uh, you can now use LaTeX in several places in a visualization. So those are all uh, screenshots of Bokeh plots we can see right here. Um, that's been a really long requested feature. And thanks to some funding from the Shen Zuckerberg Foundation, we've finally been able to make that happen. Um, this actually took quite a lot of work in the background and we had to change a lot of how Bokeh actually handles text in general. So there will hopefully be also some other nice text features to take advantage of all that work that happened in the background. So you can see here, uh, LaTeX works on axis labels. Um, it works on axis ticks and it works on div widgets. Um, and we will have LaTeX support on hopefully many more elements uh, in our next releases. Another thing that we uh, worked a lot uh, for the 2.4 release on um, are the docs, our documentation. Um, and among many things in there, we rewrote and restructured most of our contributor documentation. So um, that also ties in nicely with what Logan talked about a little earlier. So we not only have information about how to contribute uh, to the code base, we also have lots of information on how to contribute in other ways, like uh, working on the docs or how to ask us questions, how to get in touch, how to file issues, how to work on the GitHub repo. So definitely uh, everyone check that out. Um, and we also have uh, those nice uh, colorful boxes now that make it really easy, I think, to quickly find the right information if you want to contribute to Bokeh. So for example, we now have a very detailed step-to-step -step guide to setting up a development environment. So you can, as you can probably imagine, because Bokeh consists of a Python component and a JavaScript component, this can get a little complex to get all that working together correctly. So we now have some very good step-to-step, step-by-step uh, step -step instructions for that. Also, the testing suite for Bokeh, of course, is a little more complex uh, because of all the visual elements, the interactive elements. So there's also now some uh, new documentation on how to run all those tests locally. And then there's, of course, a lot more. Um, we now have improved SVG exports. That also uh, was a much requested uh, feature, especially for visualizations that have multiple plots in them. Now they uh, export beautifully to SVGs and you can use that as a basis to create PDFs or do uh, other things that you couldn't do with just a PNG export. Um, there are several improvements to the Bokeh server, that component that I mentioned earlier that basically keeps things between Python and the browser JavaScript in sync. Um, you can now use base maps from XYZ services and map plots. And we now also have wheels on PyPy finally. Um, so for more details on what is going on in 2.4 and what is new there, uh, I'd also recommend you check out the blog, blog.bokeh.org that has a very detailed blog post on what is new in 2.4. So looking ahead just a little bit, um, there's lots of things that we're working on for Bokeh 3.0. Of course, lots of improvements to the existing code base and maybe some major focuses I would say would be on improving compatibility with existing web frameworks, things like Angular, so things uh, that run in the browser, um, improving accessibility. Um, that is a, a big uh, topic currently for the plots themselves. So for the output Bokeh generates itself uh, to improve accessibility there and also for our docs and website. And uh, another thing that we're working on um, is, uh, for example, better support for WebGL, new ways to uh, actually put bring our output into the browser. Now, all of these fun ideas uh, bring us to the last question for this little lightning talk. How do we get there? How do we get all those nice new things? Well, of course, with your help. Uh, Bokeh is an open source project and it only exists because 
of people who contribute. Um, there are many things how uh, you can help coding and non-code related. Um, you should definitely check out our new contributor docs and our website, um, our GitHub repo. And there's also a po bokeh sprint that we're doing on Saturday. So since you're all here on PyData, I hope you'll all uh, join us on Saturday. That is 1600 to 2000 UTC. Uh, you might have to convert that to whatever time zone you're in. And uh, we already have our little Slack channel up uh, here on the PyData Global Slack. So if you come find us at Bokeh Sprint, that would be great. We can just chat about Bokeh visualization in general. And of course, it would be great uh, if you join us for the actual sprint, maybe help out with a little issue or two, or yeah, just chat about Bokeh in the state of visualization. Thank you very much. And I think we may have maybe a minute or so for questions. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, I'll talk to you yeah. on, the, on the Slack channel. All right. Thank you, Timo. Uh, it was a nice presentation. And I really look forward to the uh, sprint. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure like there are other maintainers are also joining us for the sprints, right? Correct. Yes, we'll be uh, four, a total of four of us will be there. Awesome. awesome. That will be great. So yeah, uh, please uh, have a chat with Timo on Slack and the Slack channel that we have created book sprints. And if you have any questions, ask him in the ask him ask him in the Slack. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, do we have our next speaker? Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about using IPython as presentation tool. And the question is, why do we want to do that? Hold on, I just lost something. Uh, and IPython is interactive. You can run code. And it's much more fun than these boring slides. I pretty much sure that I lost some of you to Twitter by now. So stick with me. We're going to move to something much more fun than uh, these slides. And this is IPython, right? So IPython, it's interactive. Um, a lot of people are now questioning what is going to happen now. It's, it's a live demo, how many mistakes I'm going to make here. And it's also very uh, focused on what I'm doing. There, there's not. Uh, a lot of destruction going here. So, right, you can do the uh, the usual stuff of uh, Python, which is run some code and show the results. And you can uh, do discovery and have interaction with the audience, uh, which I find it's more fun than showing slides with pre prepared um, answers. But IPython gives us more, it gives us magic. So, uh, I can do uh, this, for example, and then people can look at the code. It is nicely highlighted. There are line numbers, so you can discuss uh, which lines. And I can say on line 20, I define X. And now let's look at the shape of X. And I also have the code inside IPython. So it's both showing us the code and I can play around with the code. It's much more interactive. So how can I do this uh, SOC? And these are the magic commands that you can uh, Mickey, uh, I think we can't see your terminal. We are only seeing the slides right now. I think you're supposed to. Oh. Yeah, I think I think now uh, we would be able to see. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, as I said, uh, you can do the um, these calculations of uh, seven times thirty, or you can run SOC. And then you can see the code. You can have line numbers discuss about line twenty. And then look at x dot shape or why the shape? And I have the code here so people can see what's going on. So what is this SRC? This is a magic command I wrote to IPython. Um, the double question mark at the end is an IPython extension to show the source of things, including magic commands. So I can do this magic command and see what's going on. Sometimes I would like to display some text. So uh, I can use the built-in cat command, for example, to do uh, some kind of a poll, how would you rate your Titanic experience and see what's going on. But, you know, this is just text. It's a little bit boring. So why not do it with a bit more style? Uh, and then I can have colors and other things. And again, uh, this is just an alias for glow. It's a command line utility that renders markdown uh, on the screen. I can also say, you know what? You have only 10 seconds to answer this um, poll and this is, uh, is going to run an interactive timer. So IPython gives you a lot of things to do interactive widgets with very little um, 
effort by what you're doing. And this one is using a library called TQDM, which uh, show progress bars, both on the terminal and IPython. Uh, if you want to uh, do something uh, more uh, grand for uh, counting down, uh, there is a utility called term down. And I'm going to say that I want to use the da font and I want it to speak in English and I'm going to give it seven seconds. And now it's going to count down Nine seconds. and even speak Three, and even change two, the color. One. So combination of IPython and a lot of uh, nice utilities. What about images? So if I want to look at images, uh, one thing I can do is I can use the system command. So I'm on Linux X, XDG open, but you can use also uh, open on Mac or start on Windows. And for example, uh, show people the captain of the Titanic. Um, this is Edward Smith. Um, but uh, I can also do um, iCat, uh, sorry, the magic iCat. And you can see it on the screen. And there are two options to do that. One is to use the terminal I'm using, which is called Kitty, which has this ability, or you can use the QTI Python to show the images there as well. By the way, making mistakes when you're doing live codes is part of the fun. So get used to it, you're going to do it. Sometimes we want uh, big text. So here we have two utilities. One is called Figlet and the other one is called Toilet. <laughs> Uh, so if I'm going to echo IPython through uh, Figlet, uh, this is going to show IPython in a big text. Um, Toilet has its own font and Toilet has a set of fonts. So I can do it like this. And this is a different font that I can do. Another thing we do a lot also is show math equations. And here, uh, I don't have a really good solution, um, but using Unicode. Right, so in Unicode, you can do a lot of stuff with equations. There are um, superscript and there are all the letters and, and many other things you can use, but it's not as good as LaTeX. So the other option is to generate the images in LaTeX and, and show them as they show. And finally, it's always uh, good to remember that you have this um, um, nice utility called Kause, uh, which is always a, a heated parties, uh, which is a cow, cow that the uh, is talking. Uh, so that's it. I hope uh, I'll, I'll convince you to try out IPython to give a talk next time. It might be more interactive, more fun. It will cause people to wonder, how are you doing all these things? Uh, and thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Mickey. And this is this is like a perfect lightning talk, like, you know, showing your hacks and tips, what you do, and, you know, to make your, make your work more productive and things like that. And uh, like, thank you for thank you for covering this. And uh, I'm sure you have joined the Slack, right? Yeah, but uh, the thing is, this is uh, half past midnight my time. So ask me questions there. I will answer tomorrow. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Please take care of the time zones. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, this is the so so this was the last lightning talk of the first day of first lightning slot lightning talk slot. And uh, we are we are basically at the time, so I think yeah uh, we can ask your questions. And if there's anything uh, during the conference that you would like to, if there's any doubt or any questions, you can find me on the Slack. I'm by the name Sanket Verma, and uh, feel free to connect me or, and with my teammates over at the Slack. And yeah, see you around.